Income tax 2023-2024. Maker's depreciation. How is the depreciation deduction figured? Part number one. Get ready and some coffee because we'll need to handle a little perspiration to push through with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of the first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and More, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship Schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. Remember, in the Schedule C itself, basically an income statement having income minus business expenses which you could call business deductions resulting in in essence net business income which is what rolls in from the schedule c to line one income of the formula a formula that outlines the calculation on the form 1040 of which we see the first page here schedule c ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income Part 1, Additional Income Schedule C rolling into Line 3, Business Income. This is the Schedule C, Profit or Loss from Business, having an income statement format, Income Minus Expenses. We're on the expenses, which usually has the most different kinds of categories within it. Some expenses more complex than others, such as, for example, even if we're on a cash-based system, being forced to do some accrual things such as the depreciation of property. So when we buy property, uh, property, plant, and equipment, depreciable assets, instead of putting it on the books as an expense, the tax code following generally accepted kind of concepts, accrual concepts, forces us to put it on the books as an asset, which we don't have a balance sheet, Therefore, we can put it on a separate depreciation schedule representing the balance sheet account of assets minus the accumulated depreciation, a contra asset account, and calculating the depreciation expense that we can take possibly in the current period. Remembering also that the tax code generally will borrow from accrual concepts, and that's what it basically does with the maker's part of the depreciation and then we'll add on top of that all the funny business for the politicians haggling and the lobbyists and whatnot, which are kind of like the special depreciation and the 179, the upfront methods. So you can think of the makers as probably the heart of the concept of depreciation and therefore the part of the tax code that should be more stable over a long period of time, whereas the changing components are going to be how much you can deduct upfront such as the 179 deduction and special depreciation. We're looking at the maker's uh, depreciation at this point in time, kind of the heart of the whole conceptual depreciation process, which aligns to accrual concepts generally. So how is the depreciation deduction figured? To figure your depreciation deduction under makers, which is our typical process uh, when, when doing uh, the tax code, that's our default usually, you first determine the depreciation system, property class, uh, placed in service date, basis amount, recovery period, convention, and depreciation method that, the, that apply to your property. So we discussed many of these like uh, 
on their own in prior presentations. It sounds like a lot, but once you have it down, you can say, okay, what do you need if I was to depreciate something? I have a piece of equipment. I need to depreciate it. What would I need to do? Well, I need to know the depreciation system that I'm going to be using. I need to know the property class because the property class will tell me how many years I'm going to depreciate it over. Is it three years, five years, seven years, 10 years? The basis amount, which is basically the cost or adjusted cost that I'm going to have to, instead of expense, depreciate over the, over the uh, life of the property. The recovery period is basically something that you're going to get from usually the property class. So if it's five-year property, then you would expect the recovery period to be five years, right? So it's often in the name of the property class. The con <clears throat> convention that we're going to use is, for example, what we're going to do in the first year and the last year of depreciation, such as the mid-quarter, mid-month, a half year convention, for example, and depreciation method, which is usually determined in part by the class and so on. So if we're using makers, oftentimes we're talking that double declining balance method, but we can also, as we saw, use the 150, maybe election sometimes, or a straight line. Okay, so then you are ready to figure your depreciation deduction. You can figure it using percentage tables provided by the IRS, or you can figure it yourself without using the tables. Now, when we think about the conceptual idea of like a double declining balance or straight line depreciation, we can plug it into Excel, for example, and we can kind of, we can do the calculation as you would do in, a, in an accounting course or something like that. But the tax code will often make it a little bit easier by just providing the tables, which does make it a lot easier when you get to things like double declining balance, because there are funny rules with regards to it, because it actually doesn't work out perfectly and you have to kind of make some adjustments towards the end of the life. So the percentage tables are what's probably going to be used because that's what's going to be provided usually by the tax software is going to use those tables generally. So using makers percentage tables to help you figure your depreciation under makers, the IRS has established percentage tables that incorporate the applicable convention and depreciation method. These percentage tables are in Appendix A near the end of this publication. So depreciation methods. Note uh, that the declining balance method is abbreviated as DB. So sometimes you might hear that like a double declining balance. That's what I keep on calling it because that's what I learned it as. And straight line is SL. So a method, GDS, which is the normal thing that we're often going to be seeing use, using a 200 double declining or double balance. So type of property. So we have the non-farm uh, three, five, seven, and 10 year property, farm three, five, seven, and 10 year property placed in service after 2017. So that's generally what we're going to be using that double declining Beth method with these property, with these uh, types of property. We looked at those categories in the past. Benefit provides a greater deduction during the earlier recovery years. That's what the double declining does changes to straight line when the method provides an equal or greater deduction. In other words, we're going to get more of a deduction up front, which means you're going to get less of a deduction at the end. Because if you're deducting a 10,000 piece of property, for example, over five years, you can deduct an even amount over five years. Or in this case, we're deducting more up front, which means the latter years are going to have less of a deduction. And again, it doesn't work out perfectly the way the double declining balance is calculated. And therefore, when we use the double declining percent and it comes out less than the, the, the straight line, then we kind of we, it switches over to the straight line. So it gets a little bit wonky on the calculation. Obviously, software helps us with that. Uh, what we need to know, of course, is the concept of when we would want to apply double declining and 150 and so on and be able to deconstruct what the software is doing as well. We have the GDS using 150. So we have farm three, five, seven, 10 year property placed in service before 2018, all 15 and 20 year property, non farm three, five, seven or 10 uh, year property, farm three, five, seven or 10 year property placed in service after 2017. So it provides greater deduction than uh, during the earlier recovery periods because it's not 200, but it's kind of in the middle. Uh, so it's not as low as straight line. 
uh, changes to straight line when the method provides an equal or greater deduction. So similar concepts between these two methods. And then we have the GDS using straight line, which is the, the non-residential real property. So when you're dealing with real estate, for example, you're usually using the straight line. Makes sense to me because you're using that large pieces of property. Residential rental property, trees or vine bearing fruits or nuts, water utility property, all three, five, seven, 10, 15, and 20 year property, property for which you elect section 168K4 of the Internal Revenue Code for a tax year beginning before January 1st, 2018, qualified improvement property as defined in section 168 E6 of the Internal Revenue Code provides an equal yearly deduction. Then you have the ADS using straight line, which isn't usually what we use, but we saw before that we could possibly elect that or need to use it in some cases where we have the listed property using 50% or less for business, property used predominantly outside the United States, tax-exempt property, tax-exempt bond finance property, farm property used when an election not to apply the uniform capitalization rules is in effect, uh, important uh, property, imported property, any property for which you elect to use this method. So any non-residential real property, residential rental property, or qualified improvement property held by an electing real property trade or business, any property that has a recovery period of 10 years or more under GDS that is held by an electing farming business. And then we have some of our items down here uh, for the footnotes of that have been marked up top if you want to go into those in more detail. All right, and we'll give you these slides hopefully so you can check those out if you want or of course look at the publication. Which table to use? So Appendix A contains the Maker's Percentage Table Guide which is designed to help you locate the correct percent tables to use for depreciating your property. So the percent tables immediately follow the guide. So the tables can be more confusing than you would think because of course you're gonna need a different table for if each of the different methods, double declining and versus the 150 and so on and so forth. And there's also gonna be complications in terms of the first year calculation uh, because you might have a half year, but if you have a mid month calculation, that's gonna make it different as opposed to uh, a mid quarter convention, uh, for example. So rules, so you have to make sure you have the right table, obviously. So rules covering the use of the tables. The following rules cover the use of the percentage tables. You must apply the rates in the percentage tables to your properties unadjusted basis. You cannot use the percentage tables for a short tax year. See figuring the deduction for a short tax year later for information on the, on the short uh, tax year rules. So obviously the tables become complex. They're, they're trying to make the tables for like a double declining balance easy. Whereas the double declining balance calculation is a little bit complex because you have to figure like the book balance or the, the remaining basis each period and then apply the percentage and then see if it's uh, greater than the straight line or not and so on. So it's a little bit complex. Maybe we'll do an example in Excel to show you that in our example problem. So once you start using the percentage tables for any item of property, you must generally continue to use them for the entire recovery period of the property. Obviously, consistency is important here, and that means you want to get the proper election up front because you're going to depreciate these items over the life of the property, three, five, seven year property, and you need to be consistent uh, generally in doing so. You can't switch around because that will cause all kinds of problems. So you must stop using the tables if you adjust the basis of the property for any uh, reason other than depreciation allowed or allowable or an addition or improvement to that property that is depreciated as a separate item of property. So basis adjustments other than those made due to the items listed in four include an increase in basis for the recapture of a clean fuel deduction or credit and reduction in basis for a casualty loss. Somewhat of an un unusual situation, but remembering that we have to deal with that interplay between possible tax benefits and the basis of the property. The basis of the property kind of being like the cost of the property in essence, 
which the adjusted basis is going down with depreciation. That's the potential energy, the potential deduction that we have that we would generally like to take sooner rather than later, if possible. Basis adjustments due to recapture of clean fuel vehicle deduction or credit. So if you increase the basis of your property because of the recapture of part or all of a deduction for clean fuel vehicle or the credit for clean, view, uh, clean fuel vehicle refueling property placed in service before January 1st, 2006, you cannot continue to use the percentage tables. For the year of the adjustment and the remaining recovery period, you must figure the depreciation deduction yourself using the property's adjusted basis at the end of the year. Somewhat of a, a special situation. Basis adjustment due to casualty loss. So if you reduce the basis of your property because of a casualty, you cannot continue to use the percentage table. So we have, again, a similar situation. Example. On October 26, 2022, Sandra and Frank Elm, calendar year taxpayers, bought and placed in service in their business a new item of seven-year property. It cost $39,000, and they elected a Section 179 deduction of $24,000. So they also made an election under Section 168K7 not to deduct the special depreciation allowance for seven-year property placed in service in 2022. So remember, we're looking at makers. That's the heart of this thing. But we have those two upfront depreciations, special depreciation and 179. So they're going to take the, the 179 and uh, not the special, it looks like, is the, is the scenario here. So, okay, so their adjusted basis after the section 179 deduction was 15,000 because it was 39,000. That we imagine they would like to take it and just call it uh, equipment expense, but the government won't let them. You have to put it on the books as an asset and depreciate it. So they put it on the books as an asset and depreciated a large part of it, 24000 in the form of basically 179 deduction, leaving 15000 to then depreciate over the maker's calculation is the general idea. So they figured their maker's depreciation deduction using the percentage tables. So for 2022, their maker's depreciation deduction was 536. So in July 2023, the property was, was vandalized and they had a deductible casualty loss of $3,000. Sandra and Frank must adjust the property's basis for the casualty loss so they can no longer use the percentage tables. So the adjusted basis at the end of 2023 uh, before figuring their 2003 depreciation is 11467 So now you had to adjust the basis because of the casualty loss, which messes up the table calculation. So they figured their amount by subtracting the 2022 maker's depreciation of 536 and the casualty loss of 3000 from the adjusted uh, from the unadjusted basis of 15000 they must now figure their depreciation for 2023 without using the percentage tables figuring the unadjusted basis of prop of your property so you must apply the table rates to your property's unadjusted basis each year of the recovery period. Unadjusted basis is the same basis amount you would use to figure gain on a sale, but you figure it without reducing your original basis by any maker's depreciation taken in earlier years. So that sounds kind of confusing, but the idea of the tables is that I'm gonna take the, I'm gonna apply the percent basically to, to the unadjusted basis. So if, the, if I bought it, for example, for $10,000, then I would like to be able to use that same $10,000 times each of the numbers in the table if it was five-year property for five years. The way you would typically have to calculate uh, if you did it on a year-by-year -year basis is to figure out basically the book value or like the adjusted basis that has not yet been, been uh, consumed. So, so maybe we'll take, so in other words, if I took that $10,000 and I divide it by, uh, divide it by five years, we'd have 2000 divided by 10,000. That means we have a 20% straight line rate. If I double that times two, we have a, we have a 40% straight line rate. So in the first year, I might take that 40% times, times the 10,000 
and that would be 4,000. I'd probably have a half year convention because I assume I bought it in the middle of the year divided by two, and that's gonna give me 2,000. And the following year, what do I have then left? I had 10,000, that would be my original basis minus 2,000, so now I have 8,000 left, right? And if I was going to apply the double declining rate normally under a normal accounting calculation, I would multiply this amount, the 8,000 times the 0.4, the double declining rate, and get the depreciation for that period, 3,200 for the year. But if I'm trying to give a percent, I don't want to have to figure out that book value. I want to take that original 10,000, the unadjusted basis, and then just multiply that times the amount of the table. That would be easier. So that's what the tables are trying to do. They're trying to make it easier by not having to figure out the, the adjusted basis each time and then apply the rule to, to, to have the double declining rate and then see if that's greater than the straight line rate and all that stuff. Okay, so, so however, you do reduce your original basis by other amounts, including the following. Any amortization taken on the property, any section 179 deduction claimed. So in other words, if I had that $10,000, the upfront amount that I'm taking in 179, if I bought it for 10,000, and I took 179 of 7,000, then I'm depreciating four makers only 3,000. So I'm not gonna take the original 10,000 in that case. I would be applying the same conceptual rules that we just went over, but with the 3,000 as kind of like the unadjusted basis for purposes of makers. So any special depreciation allowance taken on the property, same thing for the special depreciation, same concept as with the 179. So for business property uh, you purchase during the year, the unadjusted basis is its cost minus uh, these and other applicable adjustments. So if you trade a property, your unadjusted basis in the property received is the cash paid plus the adjusted basis of the property traded minus these adjustments. So usually when we buy, when we buy property, that's usually how we get the property then the the cost of the property is going to be in essence our starting point our basis when we get the property in some other format such as a trade that can be a little bit more confusing to get that initial calculation of what the original cost or basis should be same with if we got the property in like an inheritance or something like that or by gift or if we transfer it from uh, personal to business then getting that initial basis amount can be a little tricky. Okay, maker's worksheet. So uh, you can use the worksheet to help you figure your depreciation deduction using the percentage tables. Use a separate worksheet for each item of property, then use the information from this worksheet to prepare form 4562. Obviously, software helps with this. Uh, do not use this worksheet for automobiles. Use the depreciation worksheet for per passenger automobiles in Chapter 5. So you'll recall that cars have different kind of uh, caps on them because you, I imagine this by saying the IRS is imagining people trying to, to, to get a big expense for a $300,000 car when, again, that doesn't seem like it's something that you would need to drive from point A to point B in a business. But, so maker's worksheet, uh, keep, keep your record. So we have maker system GDS or ADS, property class, date placed in service, recovery period, method and convention and depreciation uh, rate. So part two, uh, we have the cost uh, or other basis, basis investment use, uh, meaning is it business or uh, business or investment related to personal prop? Uh, multiply line seven by eight total claimed for section 179 deduction because we need to reduce the 179 deduction for the calculation of the makers. Subtract line uh, 10 from line nine. This is your tentative basis for depreciation. 12 multiply line 11 by the applicable percentage if the special depreciation allowance applies. This is your special depreciation allowance. Enter zero if this is not the year you place the property in service, the property is not qualified property, or you elect not to claim. So this is the, the special. So these are the upfront depreciation so we can get down to the heart that we're gonna depreciate using makers. Subtract line 12 from line 11. This is your basis for, the, for depreciation. 14, depreciation rate. 
And so now we, now we finally have the basis that we can just easily now go to the table and apply the rate, which if using software will hopefully be calculated by the software. Multiply line 13 by line 14. This is your maker's depreciation deduction. Okay, example. So you bought office furniture, seven year property for $10,000 and placed it in service on August 11, 2023. You use the furniture only for business. This is the only property you placed in service this year. So you did not elect a section 179 deduction. So we're removing that upfront deduction to kind of simplify the problem. But if you did have 179 deduction, all you'd have to do is basically reduce the basis by the 179 deduction and or if you had special depreciation, similar thing, because we're trying to get to the adjusted basis after those upfront amounts so we can calculate the maker's portion, which is the normal calculation similar to accounting processes, although we're using tables instead of doing the full calculation by hand. Okay, well, deduction and the property is not qualified property for purposes of claiming a special depreciation allowance. So your property's unadjusted basis is its cost $10,000. So you use GDS and the half year convention. So we're using GDS, which is our normal, the normal thing, half year convention, which means we assume we purchased it in the middle of the year to figure your depreciation. So uh, you refer to the maker's percentage table guide in appendix A and find that you should use table A1, okay? Multiply your property's unadjusted basis each year by the percentage seven year property given in table A1. You figure your depreciation using maker's worksheet as follows. Okay, so number one, maker's system. It's gonna be the GDS system. Property class, it's seven year property. The date placed in service, 8 11 23. Recovery period, it's seven years. It's seven years because it was in the seven year property category. This looks redundant, but it's not really. It's just that the tax code got better at naming their property classes to put the year in it in most of them. So, uh, number five, method of conversion, 200%, which is double basis or double declining basis, however you want to call it, half year which sometimes is abbreviated as just HY, which means you're assuming that we purchased it in the middle of the year. So although we purchased it here uh, in 811, we're gonna assume it was purchased right in the middle of the year, making the calculation easier. Six, depreciation rate from the table. So then we just pulled in this depreciation uh, rate from the table. So cost or basis, uh, cost or other basis, we're saying it costs 10,000. Uh, business usage, we're saying it's 100% business, not personal, it's for business. Multiplying that out, we get the same 10,000. Total claim for 179, we said we didn't take any. Subtract out, so we still have this basis. This is your tentative basis. Multiplying line 11 by the applicable percent, if the special depreciation allowance applies. Once again, we're saying that it didn't qualify for special depreciation, therefore we entered a zero. And therefore, we still have the same uh, basis for depreciation of the 10,000, which we can now apply the calculation from the table of, which is the 0.1429 uh, to give us the uh, depreciation using makers of 1429. Now, if I was to just try to calculate that first year manually, just to give me an idea to kind of double check, imagine the software did this. And now I'm going to go, okay, does that make sense? Well, it was a 10,000 piece of property. If it was straight line depreciation over seven years, then it would be that it would be that amount. Hey, that looks like the same amount. Why is that the case? Well, let me keep going. If I took that amount divided by the d divided by the 10,000, I would get a rate of this, right? Or I can do it this way, just one divided by seven. There's my straight line rate. If I double that times two, then I'm going to get what I would call my double declining rate. And if I multiply that, then times the basis of 10,000, that would give us our uh, 2,857. But that would be for an entire year. I purchased it kind of towards the end of the year, but I assume that it's a half year convention. Therefore, I take this full year number divided by two, and I get back to this 1,429. So this rate looks like you're gonna say, well, yeah, I calculated that rate, that's easy to do. I calculated it in essence. 
But when you get into the second year, instead of taking the adjusted basis, 10, if, instead of taking like the rate that I calculated, which was one over seven times two, times the, which would be 0.2857 times the adjusted basis, which would be 10,000 minus what we adjust, what minus 1429. I'd have to multiply that rate times the 8,571, the adjusted basis. But that's confusing. We want to just apply the second year number from the table times the same unadjusted basis, which would still be that 10,000. That's the general idea. That's why it's easier. Uh, and it's it. So if there are no adjustments to the basis of the property other than depreciation, your depreciation deduction for each subsequent year of the recovery period will be as follows. So this will be uh, 2024. The basis is the same. Notice they didn't, they're not doing this calculation based on the adjusted basis, which would be the basis minus the prior year depreciations times the percentage of the tables. You can see the percentage tables go down. The depreciation deduction is declining. That's why it's an upfront or what we call accelerated depreciation method where depreciation more happening upfront. The total of all the depreciation, 2449 plus 1749 plus 1249 plus 893 plus 892 plus 893 plus 446, adding up to uh, the uh, 8,571, and then I think plus the 1429 adds up to the 10,000. We don't depreciate any more after that because we have fully depreciated, taking advantage of that potential energy over the life of the property. Potential energy being the potential deduction which we took over the life of the property. Examples, the following examples are provided to show you how to use the percentage tables and both examples assume the following. Uh, you use the property only for business. So we're not splitting between business and personal. You use the calendar year as your tax year and uh, you use a GDS for all of the property. Okay, example number one. So you bought a building and land for $120,000 and placed it in service on March 8th. The sales contract shows that the building cost $100,000 and the land cost $20,000. Uh, so it is non-residential real property. The building's unadjusted basis is its original cost. So this is first thing to note, if we buy real property, real estate, then we usually pay one lump sum, in this case, $120,000, but we're buying kind of two things that we have to put on our books in terms of the fixed assets. We have the building part and the land part. We have to separate those two out because the land is not something that we can depreciate because it doesn't go away in like human lifetimes, at least. The building, however, does deteriorate. Therefore, it makes sense to have depreciation. How do you do that in practice? Well, you might look at the property taxes that can help you to kind of break out the amount that was for land versus building. Once we have that, we depreciate the building part. So you refer to the maker's percentage table guide in Appendix A and find that you should use table uh, A-7A. March is the third month of your tax year. So multiply the building's unadjusted basis, 100,000, by the percentage for the third month in table A-7A. Uh, A. Now note the tables are a little bit more complex here for the real estate than possibly what we saw with the last example because now instead of having a mid-year convention where we just assume everything was bought in the middle of the year, we have a mid-month convention with real estate. So now the tables have to indicate which month we bought the first, the first purchase in because the, half, the par partial year of the first year will be different based on the month that we purchased it in, right? So, so multiply the building's unadjusted basis by 100,000 by the percent. Okay, so your depreciation deduction for each of the first three years is as follows. So year one, you've got the 100,000 times the percent 2.033, that's year one. Year two, we're using the same 100,000 times the, the rate 2.564. Year three, same rate. Now, why is this the case? This looks different than what we did before because here, because we have real estate, 
the, the code says that we have to use a straight line method. So we're basically just using a straight line method here. So if I had the 100,000, 100,000 divided by then uh, the, what did, what, what did we say the property's life was? It was, I think it's gonna be 39 years divided by 39. So that gives us that 2,564 about. And then the first year is different because we bought it in the middle of the first year. So we had to do the, the mid month convention, which I won't show the calculation for, but you can get an idea of, of the fraction of the year. It's gonna to have to calculate, uh, assuming we bought it in the middle of a month. Example number two. So during the year, you bought a machine, seven year property for $4,000, office furniture, seven year property for $1,000, a, uh, and a computer five-year property for $5,000. You place the machine in service in January, the furniture in September, and the computer in October. You do not elect section 179 deduction, so we'll just eliminate that. And none of these items is qualified property for purposes of claiming the special depreciation. We'll just take those out because we're trying to focus just on the maker's calculation. You place property in service during the last three months of the year. So you must first determine if you have to use the mid quarter convention. So now these are types of property where usually we have the half year convention, but if we purchase a lot of stuff at the end of the year, then we might have to do the mid quarter convention. Software helps with this calculation to determine this. Important to note for planning purposes, however, so that so that you, you can note what that difference will be. If you have to switch over, it could be significant from half year to mid quarter. So the total basis of all property you placed in service during the year is $10,000. The $5,000 basis of the computer, which you placed in service during the last three months, the fourth quarter of uh, your tax year is more than 40% of the total basis of all property, $10,000 you placed in service during the year. Therefore, you must use the mid-quarter convention for all three items. So because you, pur you purchased a lot of the stuff in the last quarter, the IRS is thinking you're abusing the mid-year convention, in essence is how I would think of it, and therefore they force you to use a mid-quarter convention. So you refer to the maker's percentage table guide in Appendix A, or use software typically, uh, to determine which table you should use under the mid-quarter convention. The machine is seven-year property placed in service in the first quarter, so you use table A7. The furniture is seven-year property placed in service in the third quarter, so you use table A4. Finally, because uh, the computer is five-year property placed in service the fourth quarter, you use table A5 during uh, uh, knowing which table to use for each property, you figure the depreciation for the first uh, two years as follows. So we have the property type, the machinery, basis 4,000 for the first uh, two years. We picked up these amounts from the table uh, and boom, we have those calculations, the furniture and the computer. The most interesting part of this is the first year because now you have this situation of the partial year, which is not using a half year convention, but the mid uh, quarter uh, convention. And then the rest of the time, you would think it would be still using an accelerated method, I believe, uh, for the calculation.